What employee personnel documents should every federal government employee make sure to hold on to? Hello everyone, my name is Fatima Mahmood. Welcome and welcome back to my channel. This video reflects my own views and opinions, no one else's, and it's not been pre-approved or endorsed by any federal agency or other employer, academic program, or membership association. Although my target audience is federal government employees, I believe that people who work for state and local governments can benefit from this information, as well as those in the nonprofit and private sector. I divide the documents into two general categories of must-have and nice-to-have. One of the main points I want to illustrate is that for 21st century document management, it's important to at minimum have electronic versions of these documents saved to an electronic storage area, whether it's a laptop's hard drive, an external hard drive, or a cloud service. I don't feel that having paper versions is very helpful nowadays because it's going to be very rare that you're going to take one of these documents and physically hand them to another human being now. Most likely, depending on the type of federal employer you have, you will be filling out documents electronically, signing them electronically, submitting them electronically, whether it's via secure email attachment in an internal government email or uploading to a government platform securely. Initially, you may be saving these electronic documents onto your federal government issued laptop or desktop or OneDrive. At some point, you do want to keep a copy of the allowable personnel documents about you on your own personal storage area or device. First, check the official records management policy for your federal agency about which documents you can take off the government uh, computer government server servers that relate just to you. Um, and then maybe annually you want to somehow transfer them or migrate them maybe every couple of years. But these documents are about you, therefore you should be able to retain them uh, sometimes you might need a government-issued thumb drive, flash drive, in order to facilitate that transfer. Be more cautious, federal employee is generally someone who'd prefer to use the approved thumb drive rather than uploading documents via email or via cloud service. I'm a strong believer that all documents about you, the employee, and your employment should also be in your possession. Government databases may only retain records for a few short years, per their official record management policy. I encourage you to have a comprehensive record on as many years of your employment as possible. All these documents contain information about you. You never know what you might need from them in the future to support, prove, or dispute about you. It saves more time now for you to save allowable copies of these documents for yourself than trying to obtain them from your employer or record keeping service in the future. My first group of must have documents is all hiring documents. I did a Google search for federal government employee new hire documents and it led me to this helpful Department of Labor website that I'll link below as well as any other links I use in this presentation. This is an example only of the types of federal government new hire documents that a person might be required to uh, fill out and submit as part of their onboarding process. I'll read through them very quickly, but you can al always visit this website on your own. Your I-9 Employment Eligibility Verification Statement of Prior Federal Service W-4s, just like in other work sectors Your Federal Withholdings Forms and your State Withholding Forms uh, If Direct Deposit, sometimes it's available in other employers Sometimes it's new for people starting the federal government 
uh, emergency information. These two here, I suspect, are voluntary submissions. Your self-identification of disability and your ethnicity and race identification. I would feel very surprised if an agency mandated these two forms. If you know of any agency that does mandate them, please email me. My email address is at the end of this video, or please leave comments below. Um, various other affidavits. The most uh, common thing that you might hear of is OF-306, Declaration of Federal Declaration for Federal Employment. There are other sections of onboarding and hiring documents, which are your federal benefits, your health benefits, your life insurance, your flexible spending accounts, dental and vision that you might sign up for, uh, your retirement savings that are your extra retirement savings and your designation of beneficiaries credit checks of onboarding employees is another form that can be required depending on the job type a general rule of thumb is that if you have obtained a job for the federal government that involves finances or money or inv involves you investigating finance and money then you may have to submit your credit to be checked by the U.S. government. I did a Google search for credit check consent form for federal employees to show you an example. I'm not going to use this GSA one because I checked it and it's from 1990s. That's less helpful. Here is a U.S. Department of Justice DOJ one. Let's open it up for you. Uh, it's a simple one-page form, and it was last revised October 2008. This is what is publicly available. However, the internal DOJ organization may have more updated forms. But it's basically these forms say you authorize the federal government agency to uh, obtain reports from any consumer credit reporting agency for employment purposes. Further down here, and sometimes you have to scroll through these Google results, is I skipped the OPM one and I went to this one, yourtickettowork.ssa.gov, SSA, Social Security Administration.gov, and I trusted it because it had the .gov. Uh, <clears throat> this is a fair credit authorization form, which is a typical name of the form that you might have to submit. Uh, here's what it looks like for the Social Security Administration. It talks about your rights up front. It talks to you about who you can contact if you feel there's an issue you've been discriminated. And here's the actual uh, form that you fill out, which is basically giving permission for the federal employer, the federal agency to check your credit history. Again, the purpose of all of this is to help you create a sort of checklist or reminder to yourselves of all the forms that you should be saving for yourself in your own personal electronic space, including who you give authorization to, to check your credit history. And after a while, after you do this, if you do check your credit reports on an annual or a couple month basis, which is a healthy credit practice, you will see uh, that your federal employer's names comes up as one of those entities that checked your credit uh, history with one of the credit reporting bureaus. Thank you to the Department of Labor for putting out this sort of web page that lists all the various examples. Thank you to the other federal agencies that do the same. Not every federal agency is going to make a website like this public. Sometimes it's just going to be a list on their intranet. I encourage you to save all of your timesheets as proof of the hours you've completed. This is an example of a web-based software timesheet recording system that some federal agencies use. This software is called WebTA, and this example is provided publicly by the USDA. Um, I have experience working with this software. Uh, this is another example by the Department of Labor where their timesheet is an app that can be downloaded from third-party vendors like App Store, Google Play. Sometimes some agencies are a bit more um, cautious and if, if they have a separate app, it's pushed to the smartphones of the federal employees, uh, their work smartphones. 
um, rather than being in a public setting that other people could download. So your timesheet generally covers a two-week federal pay period. So one pay period is two weeks. Each week is 40 hours, so 80 hours total is accounted. Uh, there should be internal trainings in your organizations about um, what these rows mean. Sometimes they're not just time in, time out, or meal time, but uh, base pay, etc., or telework. And sometimes the leave time can be things like uh, vacation, admin excuse leave, sick leave, that sort of thing. But this is a very good and I think somewhat common representation of what a timesheet generally might look at. Um, some agencies might still use paper timesheets where you take pen to paper and you mainly fill out these eight hour days. Uh, sometimes in government there is the alternative work schedule where people are still doing an 80 hour week but they're doing uh, longer days on most days and they're getting an alternative work off off day. Generally, you'll see a format that's very similar to this. And of course, I'm saying that nonprofits and private sectors could have a very similar version. I'm a believer that once you validate your timesheet, which means validating you are certifying that you're being truthful and honest about the hours that you are submitted for getting paid or for getting leave pay. Once you validate it, I recommend you print to PDF your validated statement so that you have proof of this is what I submitted because other people in particular roles can have access to your timesheet and they may accidentally do something that changes your timesheet and even a little change can unvalidate your timesheet. It depends on the system, but I do know that's something that happened to me in WebTA. So once you validate, print to PDF, save electronically the version of your timesheet that shows what you did and that you signed off on it. And then within your management system or what's called timekeeping system for timesheets, uh, another person will certify that you correctly submitted this and that you honestly did uh, work the hours you say you worked or you honestly took the leave that you were eligible to take and that is called uh, processing your timesheet and you'll get a certified timesheet. This is how you can access a list of all of your certified timesheets. Uh, if your system that you use allows you to see the certified version, I also encourage you to print to PDF and download these as well. I think it's never wrong to be overly cautious in this area. So you have proof that I did this work and you have proof that someone else signed off on the fact that you did the work. When I print to PDF my timesheets for the validated one, I put the letter V somewhere in the file name before the file extension. And when I have a certified uh, one that's also processed, I'll and I save that to PDF separately, I'll put a C in the file name so that um, I, I can clearly distinguish by pay period number the two different PDFs I have saving my timesheets for that one pay period. The next must have are things previously called your pay stubs. Nowadays, some employment sectors may st still call them pay stubs, but they <clears throat> represent proof that you have actually been paid by your federal government employer. These are the flip side of the coin to your timesheet. As a general matter, when you receive your pay stub and your money is deposited into your bank accounts, you are paid for the previous two weeks and not just the week that you completed. So a funny thing about the federal government is it can have multiple names for the same exact document. So some places call the pay stubs the earnings and leave statement ENL, like the FTC and the SEC call it that. The statement of earnings and leave is another name for the same document. The CFPB and the OCC use that. And then last but not least, this called the leave and earnings statement, LES, by the Department of the Interior and the United States Bureau of Le Reclamation. I think it's hilarious that you can have at least three different names for the same document. I'd like to hear from you via email or comments below the official name that your agency uses as well as the name of your agency. Share your comments or email me about that. 
I did a basic Google search for these types of statements online and certain agencies have been kind enough to make examples of these pay stubs publicly available. So here at the Department of the Interior, Interior Business Center, they give this great example of what their pay stubs or leave and earning statements look like. My top advice from once you start getting these from the federal government is check them, double check them, triple check them. If you have the ability to mathematically figure out if the deductions are correct or not wonderful for you, great. But if you are not mathematically talented like I am in that area, just make sure that the deductions appear every two weeks to be consistent. An advantage of this interior example is uh, these spaces are hyperlinked and then there are these explanations that are available and you can further click on these to better understand that part of this government form. And as a general practice, as a government employee, I encourage you to understand forms that apply to you and understand the parts of the form that apply to you. I'm going to jump to the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. This is their example of how they explain their earnings statement. So first they do the explanation of all the fields and then they have it listed out like this. This is what the PDFs of them look a little bit more like. I'm not going to explain all aspects of a federal pay stub because there are websites about them that I've just shown you, but I wanna focus your attention on something. So federal environment generally has three components. And I always say generally because each agency can be just a little bit different. So always check your agency. So OASDI, Google that. That is commonly known as your social security tax, but it's spelled out as old age survivors and disability insurance. This is a mandatory tax that is taken out of your wages. Your FERS, CSRS, it's one type of government retirement. There are others in different agencies. That is also a mandatory type of tax savings that is taken out. The thrift savings plan, there are different versions of this government, but the main one is thrift savings plan. This is like a 401k. This is what you choose to contribute. The government does automatically contribute 1% but this is more elective. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think generally those are the big highlights. And then also for things like FERS, Social Security, um, TSP Basic, this is the government contributes as your employer to one of them. The TSP matching is if you choose to, again, elect to contribute to you, this 401k vehicle, then the government will match up to a certain percentage. I'm gonna focus right here on the FEGLI, F-E-G-L-I, which is mandatory life insurance that is taken out of your paycheck. Again, this may be different for people working in nonprofits or uh, private sector where this is not a mandatory deduction. OPM has its own website that explains FEGLI to you uh, at this address and it has its own handbook. Here is a relevant section of the handbook that I wanted to pull up for you that says, uh, as a, an eligible federal employee, you're automatically enrolled in basic life insurance unless you waive this coverage. So you proactively have to waive life insurance, but essentially your first paycheck, you it starts coming out if you miss this waiver. So always keep these and check and double check that they're consistent. I have been involved with other federal government paralegals where one person's pay actually went into another paralegal's pay because they happened to start at the same time. And you know, the federal agency process a lot of these payrolls every two weeks, so mistakes happen. So check and double check and triple check. Let's discuss another must-have, your SF-50s. These are very persuasive, pervasive forms throughout the federal government. OPM here tells you that they're called the Notification of Personnel Action, and it contains certain employment information useful to the applicant or if applying for another federal job. It is used by current and former federal employees. So that's wonderfully vague enough for you, so let's try to find you something more helpful so you can understand why you should save this information. 
here the Department of Commerce at commerce.gov has put together this guide to understanding your notification of personnel action form SF50. Other agencies may have a similar guidance publicly available. I'm not going to read through all of it because you can, but it basically offers that this is your written documentation of a personal action that affects your position or pay. Uh, and it goes through all the different boxes and it goes through an explanation of the different boxes. If you ever need more information, you can go ahead and search OPM's websites for these keywords uh, to find more information. I'm back here at opm.gov to show you what a blank SF50 looks like. Again, all publicly available information and to the extent I can get in the screen, this is what it looks like and most of these boxes are filled out. So you could get something like this from your federal agency and it's filled out and you can use a guide like Commerce's to help you better understand the boxes as needed. Let's pause for a side note and take a minute to understand the intersection of your pay stubs as well as your SF50s in a particular issue. Here I've pulled up the Wikipedia page for the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. So there may come a point in your federal career where you have to dispute something with your federal employer. It could be a personal action as it's documented in the SF50 and that SF50 also tells you the official date that that personnel action was um, enacted. Filing an equal pay lawsuit regarding pay discrimination resets with each new paycheck affected by that discriminatory action. So this is where your pay stubs, your earning and leave statements come into effect. Uh, you need to be able to save them, each of them, so you have easy access to them. This is an unofficial Wikipedia website. There are more official websites you can look up and other sorts of law to understand this. But having these documents, the SF50s and the pay stubs, uh, easy access for you um, makes it easier and saves you time to gather evidence in support of your positions and it doesn't make you dependent on another entity to uh, go and find these documents for yourself. Over the course of your federal career, you may receive lots of SF50s. Sometimes you may receive SF50s from two electronic sources. I have one electronic database source that gives me my SF50 through my current employer. And then there's another electronic source I'll talk about later that is supposed to have all your SF50s and some other of your federal employee documents for your whole federal career. I'm always going to advocate for you to save every single one of them, even if there are duplicates. I think it's better that you have them now instead of chasing them in the future. Another must have for your electronic records is your evaluations and all the parts that go into your federal evaluations. So at the beginning of the government fiscal year, you may be given something called a performance plan for your job group that you have to sign off on acknowledging that you were given this and you know that, that this contains the metrics for how you'll be evaluated for the forthcoming government fiscal year. Uh, you may have a thing in the middle of the year called a midpoint discussion or a midpoint evaluation and the fact that that occurred also may be documented electronically. There may be written narratives associated with your mid-year performance and there may be written narratives associated with your end of the year performance. The narratives could be in a word processing document that's shared with you or it can be copied and pasted into an email that's shared with you X number of days before the actual meeting in person that happens. Um, hopefully it's given to you beforehand, not during and after, but that depends on what um, is the policy and what is the union negotiation within your particular agency. At the end of the year, you may be uh, having an in-person meeting, but also the documents that you sign off on can be called your performance appraisals or your evaluations. They have different names, uh, but having a record of all of these is important, again, for all the reasons I stated before, but this is about you, so why shouldn't you have a copy? In my agency, we have a separate database that houses 
all of these documents and they're downloadable. Uh, in the comments below or via email, tell me which of these sort of names and aspects of the evaluation cycle apply to your agency um, and if your own agency has its separate database for all of this. At the time of this video, I could not locate one consistent standard form number that is used to cover all government performance evaluations. If you know that that exists in, out there, or if your agency has specific form numbers it gives to its evaluations, uh, message me in the comments or via email. The next must-haves are the completion of internal training specific to your agency. Most of the time I'm talking here about mandatory ones, but if you want to document your voluntary completion, that's fine too. So sometimes trainings happen in the old fashioned way where it's in person, everyone's generally in a room and in a, there's an attendance sheet. Uh, so you either want to take a picture of that or make sure that somehow in writing your in-person attendance is documented in official records. The most of the trainings that I've had for a while in my federal career have all been electronic trainings. So they're either through online modules that are self-paced, but you have to meet a certain deadline, or they're virtual trainings using a video call and chat and other electronic features. Sometimes these trainings, when you're complete, the system will generate a PDF that you can uh, print or download that says the name of the training, your name, the date and or time that you completed it as proof, and you can save it in an organized manner to your uh, electronic storage system. If I'm concerned that this completed training does not give me a PDF, I might have a window that shows or screen that shows oh, I completed it and it has my name, date, and time, and I'll just do a snip or a screenshot of that and save the screenshot. Uh, other times uh, with a virtual training um, where people are interacting and there is a participant feature list, the people who are running the training will somehow record the participant uh, list and have that saved, and then they may email uh, a follow-up individually to people saying, yes, we acknowledge that you attended and completed this training. I would save that email, print to PDF, save to PDF. If I'm ever in one of those virtual trainings and I'm concerned that my attendance is not going to be properly documented, what I do is I go to the participant list, I see my name, and then I'll do a large screenshot of something from the presenter slide, my name in the participant list, and I'll try to get the date and the time in the lower corner of the computer screen also documented in the screenshot uh, so that I have that proof. But again, this documentation is about proving that yes, you did something and you completed something as is required uh, by your employer just in case there's any questions about whether or not you actually did it or if there's a mistake in the system. The next must-have is documentation about federal government awards that you received. So one of the primary documents that will notify you that you received an award is an SF-50. You could get it and it could be listed as a time off award, an individual cash award, a group cash award. These are just some of the notations and descriptions. It's also possible that the agency will give you an agency level award once you meet the criteria and have been nominated. Each agency has its own sets of uh, awards and how they name the award. Along with the notification that you received the award, um, I would recommend saving the written justification narratives. So someone had to nominate you for the award and they may have been required to provide a description of why you meet the requirements for this award and there could be a lot of praise in there. So it's always good to save that kind of feedback. And aside from written justifications, uh, sometimes you'll just receive an email notifying you that you got the award and what it's about. Those are also helpful to save in case you ever use them for your LinkedIn profile or for your resumes. I emphasize these extra documents and saving of these extra documents because I've been in a federal employment situation 
where people would just get an SF50 and say they got an award or a deposit would be made into their bank account and there was no description or notification ahead of time saying what is this award and why this person got this award so you know there was a little bit of a concern of like oh i received this money or i received this um time off and i maybe it's wrong maybe this is a mistake and people trying to figure out why they received this uh, of course some people get it and they don't care about finding out the backstory but I do appreciate an environment where people are notified that they're going to get an award. The next and final groups of documents under must have are rather large groups in and of themselves. One of the big must have categories is your EOPF documents, which are your electronic official personnel folders. And that relates to the old school paper versions of your official personnel folder, which is standard form 66. Here on OPM's website, they tell you that your official personnel folder is a file containing records of your individual federal employment career. Uh, they talk about who's included in that, but these long-term records are included to protect the legal and financial rights of the government and the employee. And it's part of the government-wide system of records. Here the OPM talks about the electronic OPF and it says that uh, as of April 2010, approximately 70 agencies are in the process or have completed their implementation of using this electronic systems and that over a million records have been converted into this electronic space and not just the paper files. Uh, a way that OPM could have stepped this up is in the year 2023 could have updated this number to reflect more current times. So here you can read about the fact the employee has access to this electronic system, which is a special website database, and HR specialists have read-write access to see the employee's uh, documents. You need human resources in your federal employee to give you access to your EOPF account, and I hope that happens pretty close to the beginning of your federal career or close to each time when you start a new federal position. Here is the actual EOPF website where you log in to, ex to access your own documents throughout your entire federal career. I'd love to hear from the people who don't use this website what their agencies use as an alternative. Uh, and I'm going to try to show you if I try to log in now, uh, it's very secure and you have to have your secure credentials ready in order to log in to see all your government documents. But I'm showing this here, the EOPF database, as a way for you to go in and download all of your documents uh, so that you have a copy yourself. The last big group of must-have documents that I encourage you to save is your EKIP. Sometimes I mispronounce it as EQIP. But this is your electronic questionnaire for investigation processing. This is the electronic versions of paper or simple PDF forms that once had to be filled out for the questionnaire for public trust positions, sometimes known as SF-85s, SF-86s. So I previously had this whole um, URL to log into my equip and uh, a funny thing happens when you try to go to it, it here it shows up like this and it takes you directly to the De defense counterintelligence and security agency so i don't believe this is inaccurate i think this is just updated from um you know every five years or every new federal position that, that i've had to uh log into equip and things can change a little bit over time so I agree with the description here so far that eKIP is a web-based automated system that was designed to facilitate the processing of standard investigation forms, this is background checks, um, whether it's with the federal agency or other investigation service providers like contractors, when conducting again background investigations for federal security, suitability, fitness, and credentialing process. 
Um, Equip allows the user to electronically enter, update, and transmit other personal investigative data over a secure internet connection to a requesting agency. So a benefit of that is um, even though there is many years a gap in between when you are investigated, these automatic um, databases save your information and save your details. Certain fields are pre-populated every time the investigation comes around and so you can either keep information the same or obviously you might there are certain fields where you definitely have to delete and re-enter information my goal in the future is to do a more fuller video about equip uh, this is just a pr little bit of a preview so the key thing to remember about this is you can't just log yourself in you can't just sign up like any other website you have to be weighted by an appropriate official at the sponsoring agency like your employer to initiate the process so if you wanted to fill this out ahead of time or you know a little bit before your five-year mark if you're a little bit crazy like me you might want to do that uh, you can't you have to wait until you are allowed to do it and then you can start uh, checking your information, deleting old information, adding new information. One thing I will say at this stage of this overview is that during the years in between your investigations, keep really good list of your international travel. The dates are always the best, the month, the day, the years of your travel, if you don't have that, at least the month and the year, and include in international travel, particularly if you're in the DC metropolitan area, any time you step foot on an embassy uh, soil or consulate general uh, office, those are foreign soil, so you want to keep them. Often in the DC metropolitan area, there are events at embassies, sometimes paid, sometimes invited events, and those count as being international travel and on foil, foreign soil, so track your participation there. Thanks for hanging in with me during this video as we transition into the next section on nice to have electronic documents you should save for your personal records if they're allowed. Our first topic in that area is payroll calendars or payroll planning schedules. Of course, uh, these will be provided by your federal employer and you'll likely look at them every two weeks to confirm that your payroll uh, was deposited into your account uh, when it was scheduled to do so. And obviously it'll show you your federal holidays that you have off. But the payroll calendars are also helpful to keep in the future, just along with the SF-50s and your pay stubs or earning statements um, in case there's ever anything you need to dispute with your future employer about your pay. I'll briefly show you two different 2023 payroll schedules. Here, this one is from the Department of the Interior, and it's much more of a box grid type for every month. Uh, I'm more familiar with this type. And over here is from the USDA. Uh, it's a different setup and a different look. So I'll uh, point something out. Here, January, here's the first week, and that is considered the first pay period. So the first pay period is the first two weeks of January. Here at Interior, the first week of January, the first two weeks, are considered the second pay period because the previous December, the first pay period of that year was essentially the last two weeks of December. So second pay period, first pay period. If you look at it, essentially, the last day of the payday is a Saturday, this 14th, and then the paycheck should be coming during the first week of the next pay period, so the week of the 15th. That appears to be very similar on this schedule, even though the pay periods are numbered differently. The only reason I mention is if you are sharing household income with another federal employee, whether you're married to them or living with them, uh, this may or may not impact certain payment schedules or certain availability of monies. So keep that in mind that the pay periods are not identical for every single federal agency in terms of what they're numbered, but they do seem to fall along the same dates every year. 
The next nice to have is the documentation finalizing uh, your background investigation. And I'm talking about background investigations that are not security clearance. I can't discuss security clearance because I'm not familiar with it. I'm discussing ones that are called minimum or medium background investigations, MBI. So basically, you've uh, submitted your equip form for your sensitive or non-sensitive uh, trust position, and then months later, you've had an in-person security interview with an official investigator, and then months later, there will be a determination of related to your background investigation. And so the their determination is going to be called suitability determination. It's basically as is, determine whether you're suitable for a trust position, even though you've probably been working in that position for several months during the whole process. And then the official documentation that is given in your EOPF file is called your Certification of Investigation Notice. Sometimes it will have the standard form number DG04 on it, and sometimes it won't. So I'm going to show you examples of what your suitability determination looks like and what your Certificate of Investigation Notice looks like. Nowadays, I believe that your suitability determination is going to be sent to you via an email. Here it comes from the Office of Security within the federal agency I work. I made a note to myself that I completed my in-person security interview in August of 2011. And then I received this email in December 2011. So it takes it can take that many months or more or less depending on workload issues. And so my investigation was a minimum background investigation, not security clearance. So that's an MBI. So the interview is completed by the Office of Personal Management. And then my federal employer is going to decide if they're going to favorably adjudicate me or not for a public trust position. And again, I don't have to do anything else. They say no further action is needed. I just recommend keeping a copy of this email. Here is the 2020 version of that same email because obviously I've been have interviewed and had my background checked multiple times in my federal career. This one basically says the same. It's also from the Office of Security within the federal agency. The one difference here is that on the previous one, a supervisor was copied and I had that name redacted. On this one, this was just sent to me. This could be forwarded later to a supervisor or another person, but I'm not being told here if someone else was copied on this. Now I'm showing you what a certification of an investigation uh, actually looks like. This is very old from 2008 and you can tell it was papered and then scanned and it was punched into a folder. But I'll walk you through this a little bit. So this was finalized in 2008, but down here where it says scheduled date, that indicated when my in-person interview was. And so it also lists the investigation type, the form that I filled out for the SF 85. That was back in the day when I filled it out via paper. And here's a determination um, that I am suitable for government trust position and uh, saying that this is final. And this here says that it's part of the personnel folder for that individual federal employee. So that also means the EOPF. I downloaded this for my EOPF and other people can do the same. This type of thing is received weeks or months after you receive a casual email saying whether you're suitable for the position or not. So here's my most recent certification of investigation. Uh, I had a previous one at this current federal employer back in 2012, and I asked for a copy of this document and no one had it uh, in the federal agency. So that's something that's lost history. So that's why I think it's important to download these as it happens. So I'll jump around a little bit. So this form was signed in 2020. And obviously here's a section that says I'm suitable for public trust government work, but my scheduled date, my interview was in 2017. 
and then they closed it in 2019. So this is an example of how long it can take due to backlog, due to other things. But keep in mind, sometimes it can go at a normal speed, sometimes it can take even longer. Uh, the next nice to have are a series of documents linked together that show the determination for your full length of federal service, meaning your entire career tenure as represented in numbers. On OPM's master list of their standard forms, there's a few I want to focus on together. The SF-144 and 144A, these are statements about prior federal service, and essentially you'd be filling these out when you're transitioning from one federal position to another, and that includes military. Here, 144 uh, contains lots of information that I encourage you to read through as it relates to your statement about your prior federal service. And this is something the employee would fill out and then a final determination would be made. And similarly, this is 144A and it's called the worksheet. Similarly, you're filling things out the most important thing is not only to keep a copy of these forms that you're filling out, but to keep a copy of the signed and final one, the one that gets um, signed off on and is verified by the employer. And one of the most important things that comes out of this is your SCD. Your SCD on this example of the standard form SF-50 is your service computation day and normally it says here in box 31 that it's about your leave. Here on OPM's website, they still talk about service computation date as it relates to your leave, but there are many other things that this date relates to. The longer you're in government, the increase in benefits you get in certain areas. So your service computation date is you know, sort of like the start of your federal career, and then you accumulate a number of years. And so you always want to keep track of how many official years in federal service you have. The SCD can also be used for retirement, but another benefit it can come to is like your length of service awards, that when you're at 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, etc., you get certain awards and benefits. So all of that uh, relates to tied into service computation day and the way that those are determined time to time is the statements of prior federal service. So always check your SF-50 box 31 service computation date to make sure it's correct. The last, um, the last date that's in this box from your last federal employer to when you're starting your new federal employer, make sure it's the same. The next nice to have is on here because to me it's completely sentimental even though it's an official document. This is your oath of office, also known as your appointment affidavit SF-61. When you arrive as a federal employee, either new to the whole federal system or new to your employer, you uh, stand in front of the flag, you raise your right hand, and you swear an oath. Uh, the federal government into the U.S. Constitution. Uh, that oath is something you might have heard about on television or you might have seen immigrants uh, do it on, at their naturalization uh, ceremony, but you make the same oath when you start a federal position. Uh, and that's why to me it's very sentimental, especially if you're starting your federal career and, and you've always wanted to be a Fed or you might be the first person in your family to have a federal career or federal job. So I recommend uh, saving it for sentimental values, even though it does become an official part of your record and put on your EOPF. Uh, and it's simple, you state the oath, you fill out your information, you sign it, and then someone within your agency, like an official position, will sign off on it. I've never had to do the notary public uh, aspect of it before. The next and last nice to have e-document is an employment verification letter. This is not a standard form, uh, OPM form at all. This is something that I personally request each year from my federal employer, and I have a very practical reason for doing so. 
if you're looking for a new employer or you are applying to something outside of work that's like a special program and your employment needs to be quickly verified you could give that person your first sf50 ever you could give them your most recent ss50 these show that that you are employed it's hard for non-governmental people to put those two SF-50s together and sort of make sense of it. So an employment verification letter is a nice, simple one page document that clearly lays out that yes, you are currently a federal employee and you have been a federal employee for X amount of time. So I find it very practical to have and I ask for it at the beginning of each year. Here's one example from one federal employer. It's a very simple verification letter, it just states your name and it says that you were employed by this agency in this location what your full that you were full time what your position was and the start and end dates of your employment and i requested this many years after i had left in 2014 and it's signed and verified by a particular person within the agency usually related to operations or human capital Here's my more recent example. This also example shows that you could work for one federal agency, but certain documents and services that will be provided to you come from the aid of another federal agency. So again, I ask this for this for every single year at the beginning of the year. And it again says that I'm a full-time employee, where I work, that I work 40 hours a week, the position I'm in, and it'll have my start date there because I'm still working there. It'll have a signature of someone and a way that um, an outside person can contact them if needed. Sometimes these documents um, put salary information in there and you might need that or you could ask them to not include it when you make your request. Again, this is a completely voluntary thing for you to do. It's also voluntary for the people doing it for you. So be patient and give them the time they need to get this back to you, which I've never really had any problems with. Thank you for sticking with me through this video that I know is very long. I covered a lot of ground and I wanted to do this video and publish it for a very long time. And it's completely dedicated to all those federal employees who day in and day out uh, get through the bureaucracy. Thank you for watching my video. I'd love to hear from you on email at fmahmood at wellesley.edu. You can also find me on LinkedIn at that address. And if you do send me a connection request, please go ahead and send me a note. Before you go, please like, comment, share, and subscribe to my channel. I'd really appreciate it. And please go ahead and watch my next video. Thank you.